Ben Richmond performing on the piano in a moment. Where is Ben Richmond anyway? Ben Richmond, where'd he go? Oh, here he comes. And here he is. Hi, and welcome back to another edition of Web Business Diva, singing the praises of people who have a passion for their work. I'm Dr. Sharon Livingston, and my passion is to spotlight wonderful people who have created amazing careers for themselves that really benefit other people. And when I met Dr. Ross, Dr. Jolene Ross right here, who is the uh, president of Advanced Neurotherapy, in, what is it? Needham. Needham, in Needham, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Um, when I met her uh, several months ago, the, m one of my first thoughts was that I wanted you to be on my show. So, and the reason is because you provide such an incredible service to our community and have made a huge difference in people's lives. And so, neurofeedback and advanced neurotherapy. So first of all, what is neurofeedback? Neurofeedback is a safe and easy way to teach the brain to improve what it does. Well, why would I want to do that? Well, most people have a little bit of glitches in their brains, and as I always say, who wouldn't want a better brain? You've been brain? reading my diary. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a tough culture to live in. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure for performance, and um, there's also we're very good at messing up the brain in this culture and so the better your brain functions the better you function and so my passion is really to help people have their brains function better so that they can function better and lead fuller happier more productive lives tell me a little bit about how you came to this what is your personal story how did this happen how did you discover that you're a psychologist i'm a psychologist and i mean i'm a psychologist right. and i don't do brain therapy 
I don't know what I do sometimes, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do this. This is part of what you do. And, and I do talk therapy. I yeah. don't do scans. Well, I started out doing talk therapy. Mm -hmm. I was um, a behaviorist long before behaviorism was um, considered standard and accepted, actually. Um, and I actually started my career as a teacher. And I absolutely am passionate about children and passionate about teaching children, about children having full and happy lives. Uh -huh. And I then, I knew that there were some things that were kind of blocking them mm -hmm. from that. So as a teacher, I moved into psychology. I got a PhD in psychology from Boston College. And I started seeing children, special needs children. Mm -hmm. um, How children, come? Why? Because I'm a kid person. Mm -hmm. And because it just, well, partly because it drew me and partly because I think because of my family history. Um, in my family, when I was seven years old, my father got encephalitis. Oh my gosh. And that was tremendously disruptive for him neurologically. He was never able to work again. Mm -hmm. My brother has Asperger's disorder. Mm -hmm. My mother has what we call, had what we call the shadow syndrome, um, which is Asperger's but functional. As uh -huh. in, you know, I mean, she was a physician, which actually was perfect for someone with Asperger's, but. Um, but she, I mean, I was the one, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and I was also very passionate about children. I always loved children. I always loved learning. I mm -hmm. was always very excited about that. Well, ultimately, I had my own children. Mm -hmm. And one of my children, when I brought her to school in second grade, I was told that she had the worst ADD of anyone they had ever seen. Oh, my gosh. And I should get her on Ritalin immediately. Oh she my was gosh. worse than the worst person on Ritalin. Well, I had a specialty in behavioral medicine, so that wasn't going to be the first place I went. That doesn't and mean also, I wouldn't do it. But from what I know of you, you really enjoy taking a more natural approach absolutely. to health, and you want to be holistic about it, so that must have been horrible for you to hear. Well, what it was was a challenge, mm -hmm. and I was on the board of directors of a uh, group of professionals who did behavior therapy, and there was someone in my area that was doing neurofeedback. I mm -hmm. knew because I was reading the newspaper. And I invited her to speak. Um, and at the time, there was someone at McLean Hospital who was doing this as well. We were meeting at McLean Hospital. And that's um, down in Massachusetts. And that, right. And that person was there also. Mm -hmm. And basically, at that time, the technology was about, OK, it's going to take an academic year. And you're really not doing it for this year. You're doing it for the changes next year and that sort of thing. Um, so I took her for treatment. And I was very curious. And I wanted to know, well, would this be helpful for the kind of clients that I was, I'm seeing? Mm -hmm. At the time, I was mostly seeing adults. Um, and I wanted to know, does this help people with depression? Does it help people with bipolar? Does it help people with anxiety? Uh -huh. You know, I'm asking all these questions. And we know the answer is yes. The answer is <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, what ultimately happened is this person left the area and this other person wasn't doing it anymore mm -hmm. and there was no one around. Mm -hmm. So I went and got the training because my daughter started to lose her benefit. That doesn't happen in our practice. But well, well, how come she wasn't she being lost seen enough. She wasn't being seen frequently enough. Ah. And um, then this person said, take the summer off. We don't tell people to do that. Because this is a learning task. It's like learning a motor skill. So if you want to become a really good golfer or a really good pianist like your nephew, mm -hmm. you're not going to practice every two weeks and then take the summer off. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. You're not going to learn, and you're not going to get good at it. Mm -hmm. So that's not how we work. Um, so I got the training. And it ended up not only helping her, but then it took over my practice. And then it took over my house. And then it took <laughs> over my family. And it became a family business because it just grew and grew and grew. And my goal was to provide this service to whoever wanted it. So my goal was, OK, we're going to grow this business as much as the universe wants us to without in any way jeopardizing the quality of our results. And so what exactly is it actually? I mean, what is neurofeedback? How does that work? Well, the way it works is we monitor the brain waves. Mm -hmm. And we, um, that information goes to an amplifier, and then it goes to a screen. 
and we look at that screen and we set the parameters to reward a mix of brain waves that based on our assessments we expect will improve functioning and then it's all about reward it's like teaching your dog to sit I call them brain yummies um, it's all about reward it's a very safe way to teach the brain so what happens is when the brain is doing what we want in all of the locations that we're teaching at one time there's a reward and it's usually a um, change on the computer screen and a simultaneous sound um, if we make it too exciting then we're driving the brain into it, uh, a much more involved state and what we want is we want the brain to learn how to get itself into that state because the problem is that brains either have a tendency to be inactive in various places and therefore can't do the control stuff they ought to be able to do. So let's give a very specific example so people know exactly what we're talking about. The way that I learned about uh, you was I was wanting to help someone in my family who uh, was on the autistic spectrum who still is on the autistic spectrum, but is so different now in, in his functioning. And so I had spoken with um, another physician who said, you know, if you want to do something fantastic for that little boy, bring him to Dr. Ross because she can train him to stop some behaviors that are getting him in trouble in school. And this is a little eight-year-old boy. And so, Talk about how that works. You know, what happened? We brought him in and what happened? Well, the I know, but they don't. <laughs> the first thing that happened is I did an intake. So an intake is all about what are, what are your goals? What is it that you want to be different? Um, what's the history? And what's this person like? Lots and lots of questions about current functioning so that I get a really good sense of, so what is going on with this brain? What's the history of this brain inside this person and so forth? And where are we headed? The next thing that happens is I do a, an EEG, we call it a brain map. It's mm -hmm. electronic, um, we use a cap, mm -hmm. and I attach, you know, I get these sensors so that the sensors all work the way we want them to work so we have good connection. And, and I, I happen to have a whole bunch of slides here, yes. which I'm gonna show you right here, right now, but we're gonna have them up on the screen for people. So, so here's a, a typical kind of map, or I don't know what you would call that, a brain wave, well, these are brain waves, and what we do is we collect, I do that, I collect data, this information, through this cap that's attached to my computer, and I have the person do various things. We call it various states. Mm -hmm. So um, I have them with their eyes closed, relaxed, and in this case, this is someone with their eyes closed, relaxed. I have them read, I have them do math, I have them watch a silent video that pulls for social competence, which is really important for people on the spectrum, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I, if there are reading issues, then I have them do another something that helps pull for reading. And I remember we did a whole bunch of different... We did um, a whole bunch of things. Like yeah. math and exactly. reading and social interaction. Yeah, and different states. Different states. Comprehension and... Yeah. Yeah. Because we want to know, can the brain turn itself on? Can the brain control its own state and if it can't then where are the problems and what kind of problems are there so in this particular slide what we're seeing is um, go back we're, what we're seeing is someone who whose brain kind of goes along twiddling along so to speak with the brain waves everything's going fine all of a sudden the brain waves get really really huge like and right in the middle I see. right in the middle there and when that happens that is a moment of inactivity, mm -hmm. significantly reduced activity. And that's when the brain is unable to process the information coming in. And when a person experiences that, and you can experience it for a lot of reasons, but when you experience it, for instance, you might be reading, and mm -hmm. you'll get to the bottom of the page, and you won't know how you got there. You won't remember what you read, even though your eyes were seeing it, and so forth. And you also have what I call a working memory dump. So uh -huh. what was in your memory, is now gone. So now you've got to go back and reorient yourself a couple pages ago, even though I wish it I only never lasted to this brief <laughs> moment. <laughs> yeah. So that's very interesting. And then you have another way of showing um, what the functioning looks like. And there's yes. this colorful map here, which I thought is a really cool way because this side is not so good and this side is 
Good. Much better. So Much describe better. the two sides. So the not okay. so good side with all the blue. Well, let's go back. We're looking for a couple of things. We're looking for activation mm -hmm. in locations, and that's really about size of brain waves. So mm -hmm. what we just saw is someone whose brain waves suddenly got huge. There, are, it's also possible to have overactivation, mm -hmm. and that way, the, when, under those circumstances, the brain waves are just too small, mm -hmm. and you can't get at your brain. You can't get at those parts, even though they're going. It's like they're going a mile a minute, and you can't get at it. Huh? So that's. Part, that's one of the parameters we look at. And then the other parameter we look at is we're looking at coordination across cortex. Cortex is this layer that covers the rest of the brain. Mm -hmm. And it's all wrinkled up so it can fit. Um, and it's the biggest on us humans, and it's about the most advanced of our functioning. And it's also about control. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is we're looking at how well do each of the locations that we tap coordinate and co-vary with each of the others. And on the left-hand map here, what we're seeing is a lot of dark blue, mm -hmm. and dark blue is not enough coordination. So ah. this is a person that's challenged with various things, and again, it depends a lot on location of where this lack of coordination is. And then on the right-hand side, we're seeing what this person's brain looked like from a coordination perspective, after a, a lot of sessions of neurofeedback. So the lighter colors are showing more coordination. That That's green and the kind of yellowy green exactly. is more coordination. Exactly, and this is the same person we saw before who actually had a seizure disorder. So uh -huh. for us to have gotten this person's brain to function this much better with no medication and um, given the severity of the seizure that this person was experiencing, the seizure episodes was very exciting. Um, and so now we have this other slide that shows three different states. We've got these red lines, blue lines, and uh, <coughs> this other thing going on these on the bottom. Stuff <laughs> on the, bottom yeah. um, the little stuff on the bottom actually looks very small because these other brain waves are so enormous. This is a little boy who is on the autistic spectrum, mm -hmm. um, PDDNOS actually. And what we see is the red is. The, the represents the brain waves when we did his first EEG before his first brain map mm -hmm. before we did any training and he's got like 240 microvolts of this slow wave going on two to six which is enormous and what it means when it should really be is what oh it, it should be way down around 25 30 and it's 240 wow yeah that's quite it's a difference. ginormous absolutely ginormous so our job was to teach the brain to make this smaller mm -hmm. and also get that coordination going and so what you can see if you look at the blue is although he's not down to totally normal for his age the change is wow. enormous i mean he's at this point it's um what is that that's about 60 microvolts versus as 240. compared to 240. so the, what happened for this particular child is he had a lot of trouble with transitions and various of the kind of things that you would expect for someone on the spectrum and he ended up moving to the other coast and handling it beautifully. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And so people come for things like autistic spectrum issues, yeah. ADD, ADHD. Tell Absolutely. me some of the other things that this kind of therapy helps. Uh, brain injury. Um, Where what happens because of the brain injury? Actually, they can often look like ADD. That's mm -hmm. very, very common. Mm -hmm. And it's very common for people to come in who say they have ADD and what the story is, the way they got it, mm -hmm. could be a brain injury. It could be what I call a birth story. It is very, very common that a child with ADD will have a birth story where something was funky about the birth. They didn't want to come out and they were forced out. That it could be <laughs> no, that. I mean, I mean, it could be too too long a birth. It could be too short a birth. It could be meconium in the fetal waters. It could be a moment of hypoxia. Um, what do those things mean an, to someone uneducated uh, like me? Hy if, basically, it's stress on the infant. Mm -hmm. That's really what it's about. It's mm -hmm. stress on the fetus. Mm -hmm. And when you have stress on the fetus, this is a very important moment. I mean, birth is a very very important moment. And in fact, um, if you want a little bit of psycho trivia, um, the measure most highly correlated with success in adulthood is APGAR. So the better you come out... APGAR? APGAR. That's the number. There, They actually give a newborn a number anywhere from zero to ten mm -hmm. a, mil a minute after birth, and I think it's five minutes after birth. Mm -hmm. 
and the better your number, so the closer to 10 or 10 that you have, then the, the better you were, so to speak, the healthier you were at the moment of birth. And that's most highly correlated with success in adulthood. Well. So what we often see, although sometimes APGARs are just fine, we often see that there was a prolonged birth which put stress on the, the infant. On the infant. Um, too fast, too fast can, be just, can sometimes be just as bad. Mm -hmm. um, there are various things that can happen that, t that tell me, uh, okay, this is a birth story. And the good news is how much we can do for a child who's got a birth story. And it really is just another variation in a sense of head injury in that there's a disruption in that m very important moment and that disruption can affect the brain. It doesn't always, mm -hmm. but it can. And what so we want to do is we want to maximize a person's brain functioning. That's awesome. And one of the things that you haven't quite said yet, which I was really thrilled about, is that neurofeedback has as good results, if not better, than a lot of medication. Absolutely. Now, why would you want to put a child on medication? I mean, like Risperdal does horrible things to children, like on little boys and makes them grow breasts when they don't need them. I have to, I have to remember to not hit my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, you know, it makes people get foggy. It totally changes their quality of life. Yeah. And here's this yeah. thing that's totally non-invasive. It's drug-free. It's safe. And the results that had been documented in a number of cases Absolutely. for ADHD Absolutely. and right. uh, and other uh, problems are at least as good, if not better. So, I mean, that to me was a major draw, and that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to have you tell the world about this because I think it's so super. Well, there's a new study out of NIH actually. It's a multi-site ah. study mm -hmm. that they did, and it was a three-year study. And the first year they concluded, based on the data that they got. Um, is that they were looking at psychostimulants, Ritalin and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, Adderall, and they said, this is great, this improves attention and focus, this improves behavior, and there's absolutely no side effects, fantastic. So this affected number of prescriptions throughout the world. Mm -hmm. By year three, they, the, the conclusions had changed. What they found is by year three, there were no longer any improvements. From and the drugs. From the drugs. Uh -huh. And there were problems with growth, both in terms of height oh. and weight. Oh. So this is an NIH study. So that they weren't growing as they weren't tall growing, as they yeah, should. They weren't growing as tall as they should and so Got forth. It. And yet we have studies, several studies that have been done in my field that compare psychostimulants with neurofeedback. And what we see is significant improvements with both, but they work just as well. Right. They work so just why, as well. Why take meds that could have side effects? Yeah. When yeah. there aren't any side effects here, yeah. or you know, so incredibly minimal, it's negligible. And I think one of the things that fascinates me, I've been doing this for almost 15 years, is the longer I do it, the more I see how very efficient our culture is getting at disrupting frontal lobe function. Frontal lobe function is all about executive functioning. It's about attention, it's about focus, it's about switching from one thing to the other, it's about memory. Um, this is not a good thing. And so we really focus on frontal lobe function and frontal lobe function is also about behavior, impulsivity, and social competence. And so if you strengthen the frontal lobe if I could say it in plain English. The then, fun part of the brain. Then what you do is you give people a lot more options for their behavior. Absolutely. As well as ability for all kinds of things. So for example, I can remember coming to visit and there was a kid there who um, was working on retraining his brain for sports performance. Yep, yes. How did you, how did you figure that out? Well, actually that's what I love to ask kids about because you have to get the kid to buy in, mm -hmm. let's face it. So if a child has a sport, then it's really easy for me because all you need in a sport to do better is a little bit more focus and a little bit better physical coordination. And we're able to do that. And another thing we're able to do, interestingly enough, depending on what we see on that EEG, that brain map, is often, we're seeing more and more of this, problems with the functioning of the eyes. 
not the visual acuity, not is it fuzzy or not fuzzy, but the functioning of the eyes. Do the eyes work together? Are they able to accommodate so you can see far away and then close and make that change quickly enough? Can the lens adjust quickly enough? That sort of thing. We can see that on our EEGs. If that's and off. we can improve that. If that's off, what, how, how would one know it? Like what would they be experiencing? Um, that can very much be part of dyslexia. We see oh, that a lot in wow. reading problems. Mm -hmm. So reading problems can be, interestingly enough, in this area, which is about language. Mm -hmm. It also can be in this area, which is about vision. Mm -hmm. And it can be most dramatic and most challenging if it's in both of these areas. So and the, you have and that this, combination. And this neurofeedback can? can enhance that, can improve that. Well, also, we see visual problems in attention, attention and focus. How mm -hmm. are you going to attend if you're not seeing well? Basically, vision trumps everything in the brain. Mm -hmm. So most of our mental resources, I call it mental money, mm -hmm. is going to go towards vision. So if your brain's putting a lot of mental money into vision because the system isn't working easily, then you're not going to have enough mental money to put into those frontal lobes that are all about executive functioning. And, and when you say executive functioning, in English, what does that mean? Again, it's I'm, about, I'm be a, it's a about in company. initiation, <laughs> as in starting things. Ah. It's about inhibiting, which is stopping things. So it's about inhibiting those impulses. Mm -hmm. So it cuts down on that impulsivity. It's about switching from one thought to another, one activity to another, people get stuck in one and then they can't switch. So they get sort of this compulsive style or they get a very rigid style. Um, memory is a very, very important part of executive functioning. Mm -hmm. Organization, mm -hmm. knowing where your stuff is, making sure you bring your stuff home that you need. Mm -hmm. uh, organizing your thoughts, organizing what you're gonna write, what you're gonna say, holding it in memory while you say this is all executive functioning. That's awesome. And this has even worked for people uh, who are getting into those years when uh, memory is not. <laughs> Wait, where did I put my keys? <laughs> Normative, oh, what's it called? Um, there we go. We, uh, <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. Um, uh, normative cognitive decline of aging is uh -huh. what it is called. Uh -huh. So it's considered the norm in this culture. And it doesn't have to be the norm. Right. It's very, very possible to right. get your memory back. I had a 70-plus-year-old um, a gentleman who had been a very high-powered executive, start his own business, etc. And he used to like to play piano at odd hours and learn new sonatas. And he couldn't memorize them anymore. He just couldn't do it. So he came in for that. So a little bit of neurofeedback, and guess what? He's memorizing sonatas again. Oh, my gosh. Yes. That's fantastic. Yes. And so in case people are wondering exactly how the training works, let's show those other slides that we have. And there's a picture of a, a patient with this, you know. Uh, uh -huh. There's going to be a reward. And what happens the way behavior, any kind of behavior works, is any behavior that's followed by a positive event, the chances of it happening again increase. Right. And that's, it, it's that simple. And I think that's the hardest part to understand about neurofeedback, is that it's simply about reward, that it's totally safe, and that reward and works. And it's seamless and invisible, which is really fascinating. And natural, so you don't have to work at getting your brain to work better. The way I put it is you don't have to grit your brain's teeth. You just have to be, your brain does all the learning, and things just work better. That must be our brain calling right yeah, now. I got that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So um, what I really found fascinating, and. Uh, what I love is seeing Ben go in. You've got this catalog of pictures that he can choose whatever he wants to see. And yeah. so on this next slide, we've got a picture of uh, trees and kind of an outdoor scene um, on the bottom right. But on the top left are 
what people begin to see as their brain waves are doing what they're what supposed to do. Right. So what they see initially is they see a blank screen. On, so picture it on the left, that screen on the left, without any little squares in it. Uh -huh. And for every quarter of a second that the brain is doing what we ask, based on we saw those squiggles a moment ago, that we, the way we said it, um, there is a square that comes up. I call it a puzzle piece. Yes. And it's a piece of an image. So on the left, you can see this is a piece of that full image that's going to come up later on on the right. So people like to sit and they like to guess where the next square is going to come up or they like to try and guess what this is going to be. So that keeps them engaged. And then after, depends on the number and how old the child is or the adult or whatever, after let's say maybe about 10 of these squares, the full image comes up along with a ta-da. But every time a square comes up, there's also a sound. So they get rewarded sound. by that sound. Sound and a change, a visual change. Got it. And, and the ta-da is the major reward. Is the major reward. And right. the brain accepts this as reward. Do you know I can hear it? <laughs> Isn't that funny? I know that sound. I know the sound when the whole puzzle comes to life because I sat there with him. Absolutely. That's so funny. And what's interesting is the brains like change. Mm -hmm. They like stimulation. I remember in freshman psychology, they had an experiment where they had, in those days, they had wooden mazes, mm -hmm. and they had two wooden mazes, and they would run rats through the mazes, and these mazes were exactly alike except for one little thing. One of the mazes, the, they was, had stripes, and the stripes were painted this way. And on the other maze, they had stripes, same size, painted this way. Oh. So, which maze do you think the rat, rats ran faster in? I'm guessing where they were continuous and went around, but... No. Ah. Exactly the opposite. And how come? Because, from a rat's point of view, if the stripes are oh. vertical, things change. And so, so they ran faster because they were being stimulated by the environment. Interesting. Brains like stimulation. And that's Boy, one I feel that one. <laughs> everyone does. <laughs> everyone chooses the other one. It's, uh, it's the way people see things. But anyway, so the brain really likes stimulation. So that's one of the reasons that this works the way it does. We also have another screen that some of our people really, really like. And they get to see their own brain waves. And uh -huh. they see sort of snippets. So they'll see a snippet for each location we're working on. Uh -huh. And they also, when, so we can tell them, okay, we're trying to get your brain waves to be small inside those lines. So they can kind of use their intention as well in a much more direct kind of way. And then when that location is doing what we want, there's a green disc that comes up. Uh -huh. And when all the discs are full, ta-da! And some people really like that feedback screen as well. And the other thing is they don't really have to do anything. The, the brain the takes brain. over to do what it needs to do. Exactly. So even if they weren't trying to make it appear or trying to do anything, the, the brain does its own work without feeling like it's work. I mean, sports training by training your brain without yeah. like, you know, pumping iron or, uh, and I'm not, I know well, this that. Is pumping iron for the brain yeah. because we're literally creating new neuronal connections. And so we're making the brain more robust, except it's the easiest learning your brain will ever do. It's the easiest learning you'll ever do. And so here's a, another example of the difference after training. Um, and this is just showing yeah. one of those diagrams. Yeah, one of those little circles. So the one on the left, um, that green dot, is the location itself. Mm -hmm. And the blue surrounding it is the rest of the brain. And what we're seeing with that dark blue is those are the areas where there is not good connection. And mm -hmm. this is a frontal location, actually. And so it's extremely important that that location be in connection with the rest of the brain. So it can do its coordination and control job. So on the right, what we see is the same location, mm -hmm. and we can see a lot more of the other colors, light blue and green and even yellow. Um, that tells us that this location is coordina coordinating with much, much more of the brain. Excellent. Excellent. That was very cool. So we're back now with Ben Richmond and Laura Richmond, uh, who are clients of Dr. Ross. And so, Laura, I was hoping that you could just tell a little bit about what brought you to Dr. Ross and uh, how that worked for you and how you would describe the story and of, uh, of your journey so far with Ben. Um, 
Well, at the time we got to Dr. Ross, we tried a lot of different things and Ben had come a long way, but was still struggling a lot with tantrums and um, really not a lot of interest in socialization. Uh, very noisy at times. Eye contact. Oh, eye contact was non-existent. That was the first thing that we noticed that really changed dramatically, which was wonderful. And quickly. Very, that after the second session, I was shocked. We were with friends and all of a sudden he was looking right in my eyes and his articulation I noticed at that point also was a little bit clearer. Changing. Mm -hmm. And what else did you notice that's changed over time? Well the tantrums have been an incredible difference. Um, ben was saying in the car on the way over that he hasn't had a tantrum in school. He can't remember when the last time was that he awesome. had. Yeah, it's been like at least six weeks since there's been any incident at school at all. And the um, change in interest with peers has also been huge that we went from he was upset about the idea of any contact with peers or anyone sitting next to him to really his playing with kids, which has been wonderful. Yeah. And what have you noticed, babe? Um, I haven't had any temper tantrums. I have I often have a good days. You've been having good days. Yeah. And what's it like doing, um, you know, making the puzzle pieces come to life? It, um, if I'm tired, it can be boring. Sometimes it's boring. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah. And um, what else have you noticed about it? Like, if you, if you knew some other kid who needed to go and retrain his brain, what would you tell him about it to help him get there? Um, well, I would tell him to use a GPS. <laughs> use a GPS to yeah. find his way? Yeah. You're very funny. Now, one That's of the things about this child is that he's got a remarkable sense of humor. Okay, and... How else would you help that person to have a good experience there, aside from using the GPS to find it? Like tell him, like you use, like to use the pictures or sit still, it'll only be like forty-five minutes to an hour, and maybe someday it'll improve your brain. Mm -hmm. So you think your brain's improved? Yeah. 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 You have a cool brain. Yeah. I think you have a very cool brain. It's like one of the favorite brains I've ever met in my whole life. Yeah. I'm not kidding. And you're very cute about making eye contact today. <laughs> so and um, what we're going to do in a little bit is we're going to see Ben play piano, which he does an amazing job of. You're going to show us some, um, you're going to show us your piano playing ability? Yes, sir. Sir? Yeah. Am I, sir? Uh, yeah, you are. All right. <laughs> I say also, Ben has never complained about, you know, he looks forward to going to the Brain Place, and he's enjoyed the experience with the people there, even putting the things on. Yeah. yeah. With the Brain Dude and the Brain Dudette. You're the it, Brain Dudette. Exactly. Uh, and he's the Brain Slave. Max the Brain Slave. <laughs> Max the Brain Slave. And, 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 Dave, and, Dave, and, Dave, and David's the 911 Brain Guy. The 911 Brain Guy? Yeah. <laughs> And why is that? Well, I like 911. No, that's true. You do guy. like 911. That's true. <laughs> so, Dr. Ross, this has been really wonderful. And Laura and Ben, thank you for taking part in this little interview. How do people get in touch with you? They can get on the internet. My internet site is retrainyourbrain.com. Retrainyourbrain.com. Mm -hmm. Yes. It rhymes. That's true. It does. And then there are hyperlinks from there, too. Uh, there's our phone number, and there's email, and so on. Would you like to give your phone number? 781-444-9115. Uh -huh. 781-444-9115. Yes. And that's without any training of my brain. I know. <laughs> it's amazing. You might well, as well drop that down. <laughs> <laughs> So folks, jot that down if you're interested. So if there's an issue with ADD, ADHD, if there's an issue with autistic spectrum, if there's an issue with stroke, if there's an issue yeah. with Learning disabilities. Learning disabilities, memory. Yep. Um, Just about anything Developmental you can name. delays. Developmental delays. Mood disorders. Head injury. Bipolar. Yep. Um, anxiety, depression, head injuries. Yeah, if it's on the brain then we can probably help. If it's on the brain, you could get it off their mind. <laughs> very Ooh. good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you could probably nice, do just about nice. anything. So thank you, everybody. And 
We hope you come back to another, uh, another session with Web Business Diva and Dr. Ross, thank you very much, and, and Laura and Ben. Again, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Also, that Ben's focus in his practice has gotten so much better since he's doing the neurofeedback. His ability to work with his teacher and take criticism and work with it has gotten incredibly better. And he's also the social piece I was talking about. Uh -huh. He's willing to be part of a class, so he's learning theory and he's fantastic. Part of give and take that way, yeah. I'm not learning theory. I basically know all of it. <laughs> what did you say? He said he's not learning theory, he knows all of it. Our next generation, here it is. Thank you so much. And Ben, thank you very, very much. That was really wonderful. You're welcome.